So occasionally, uh, typically once every year or two years, I like to bring us back and uh, just talk about the mission of our church. And church mission, it might seem boring. It might seem like it's something that's the same everywhere. We're all called to share the good news of Jesus Christ. We're all called to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Um, but specifically, uh, I want to talk about the mission of our church. So if someone were to come up to you and ask you about your church, like what is it your church is about? A lot of times it starts maybe with a physical description. The one that makes me cringe, the blue roof by the railroad tracks, that's a church. <laughs> Sometimes it's the ministry descriptions, it's the Taco Tuesday or the youth group or the, the, the water bottle church or whatever it might be in some of those things. Or, or others might answer by the faces that are in the church. So it's this person's church or, or that person's church. And we have these different answers that come up to what our church is about. There's nothing wrong with those answers, but I really, as a pastor, uh, when I was young in ministry here, uh, we just shared the, the Facebook or the, 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 the article from the newspaper from 14 years ago. Um, it came up in our news feed on Facebook and about us moving to Crawford. And, and early in the time we were here, I was in a meeting, and, and there was a pastor, and he was talking about church mission. And it's something I'd always heard about, but I'm telling you, I served on staff at a church in Kentucky. Uh, for eight or nine years, and there was something on the wall, it was this seal on the wall, and around it had the mission of the church, and even though I was on the staff at the church, I couldn't tell you what it said. So often church missions were things that were on the walls, or things that were in a bulletin, but we never really followed through with them, and so I'm hearing this kind of thing, and it's going to be just another one of those things, and the meeting was in Gearing, and I was praying on the way home from Gearing, Lord, what is your church in Crawford, Nebraska, supposed to be about? And as I was praying, and again, uh, God thought that came to me, he gave me these simple words, and I thought, okay, that's it. And I felt, I was proud. Like, you ever have those thoughts? You think God had downloaded just on you? It was a moment for you. I mean, I'm thinking, I'm profound. It's powerful. I came home. Uh, I, I was excited about it. I began to search on my computer that doesn't work now. No, it wasn't the same computer then. Um, just for this particular mission statement. And what I learned was, I wasn't novel at all. The mission that God gave me for his church wasn't something that was exclusive to Crawford, Nebraska. But my heart was, God said, the church in Crawford, Nebraska, it has to be about loving God and loving people. Like if the church is going to accomplish something, his heart, the mission of the church, the purpose that we have is simply to love God and love people. Now, a few years later, I was, I was still contemplating that, and, and God expanded it a little bit. That is mission. Again, we have these words, vision, where are we going? My vision for our church, this is what people that are in church circles don't like when I answer, is that we impact our world. That's my vision. That's, this, that's, this, that's as visionary as I get. We're going to love God, and we're going to love people. And when we love God, and we love people authentically, it's going to cause impact in our world. That's impact in Crawford, Nebraska. That's impact in my family. That's impact in the state of Nebraska. That's impact across the globe because we're doing what God has called us to do. It sounds familiar. The church in Acts, we are way far ahead there. There we go. The church in Acts. It says when, 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 they, when Luke was describing the early church, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with light and sincere hearts, praising God and joined the favor of all the people. And the Lord added their number daily those who were being saved. I think if you start even in verse 43, they were dedicated to the apostle teaching. They were dedicated to prayer. And they were dedicated to signs and wonders. They were dedicated to the early church. were dedicated to loving God, right? And they loved each other. They, they, they spent time together. They authentically cared together. They broke bread in their homes. And they saw impact. The Lord had to remember daily those who were being saved. So if I ask the question this morning, who loves God? I think most raise their hand and say, yes, I love God. I think we all kind of identify with loving God. But now I want to ask a question for you to ponder. How? How do you love God? How in your life, you know, we can profess 
that we, we love God. But love in our context is such a, a huge word. We love uh, uh, the Cincinnati Bengals. We love uh, uh, Grandma's apple pie. We love our children. We love God. And it's a word that is so broad in our understanding. So how is it that you love God? Psalm uh, 43 by Elizabeth Barrett Brown. She's talking about her love for her husband. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height. My soul can reach when I'm feeling out of sight for the ends of being an ideal grace. I mean, that, that, that summit where she's counting how many ways she loves her husband. I was thinking during worship. I was just looking at the songs. I go often to express love to my wife Wake up in the morning and say, better is one day. <laughs> My heart and breath cry out. I make up the words, Dan, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she probably would smack me. As incredible as she sings, that's not the way she expresses her love to me. How unique is the relationship with God and man? You know, some might wrestle with the question, how do you express love to your spouse? And if you do wrestle with that, I would just recommend the book by Love Languages. Uh, I think it's profound and it talks about how we can express love, but that's beside the point. But it's almost impossible at times for us to conceptualize or vocalize how we express love to God. And if we're going to be a church that's about loving God, I want to spend some time looking at Scripture, seeing maybe what the Scripture says about love. Like, how do we love God? John chapter 14. If you love me, Jesus says, keep my commands. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These are the words you hear. The words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. John chapter 15, he continues. This is the chapter where he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Remain in me and I will remain in you. He's talking about the relationship that God has with man. And as he's going on in that relationship, as the Father have loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. According to Jesus, we love God by obeying him. If you love me, you will obey my commands. For us in contemporary uh, America, where we, we're all about our freedom and we're all about our rights, last week we looked at a psalm where the psalmist was saying, delight and meditate in the law of God. And those things are so foreign to us. The idea of, of commands and obedience, it's something that sometimes makes us bristle. But for God, this was imperative. It was about relationship, covenant, and purpose, obeying the commands of God. It was all about him. Remember Jesus? He has this conversation with the religious leader. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Notice that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, what is the most important? And Jesus responds, the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourselves, because there's no greater commandment than these. The, the, the religious leader is asking Jesus about the commandments, and Jesus is directly quoting a, a, a book, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6. We'll go there in just a moment when he responds to them. The unique thing is he's asking about the greatest of commandments. What's the greatest of, uh, of orders? What's the greatest of, uh, of expectations 
for believers. And Jesus' response, he said, it's this. It's the love. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I asked you about the minutes. And the response was to love. See, Jesus, he's, he's quoting the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6, as I mentioned. Deuteronomy chapter 5, if you want to look there, it's where the Ten Commandments are. Moses is being downloaded, the covenant of God. And he's coming down, and, and he's revealing this covenant. And he says, in chapter 6, these are the commands, the decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land you're crossing the Jordan to possess. He's given us laws for you. I want to pause. I said this last week. I want to reiterate it this week. The laws of God were for the revelation of promise. The reason God gave law was to reveal his promise to his people. He was basically saying, this is the path. We talked about a righteous path that we could walk on last week. This is the path. If you want to go into Jordan and you want to prosper, if you want to inherit the land that my father, had, that, that, that was promised to your fathers, then here's what you need to do. You see, God knows. He understands. Right? As parents, we can know my kids, they'll start playing. And they get a little physical. And I say, guys, it's time to stop. But we're just playing it. I know you're just playing now. But I know how the story ends. And in just a few moments, one of you is going to be crying while the other one's punching you. <laughs> oh, Dad, we know. We're okay. And guess what they do? We're not going to fight this time, Dad. Well, if they believed what I was saying, they would do what I was asking. If you believe that God is the author and finisher of all things, and that he's the Alpha and Omega, the first and last, the beginning and the end, the one who has ordered the steps of the righteous people, that's us, then maybe you would walk the way he asked you to walk. Maybe you would take the steps that he asked you to take. The covenant, the, the commands of the covenant were to preserve God's people for the promises that he wanted to bring to them. They weren't to bring burdens. They weren't to bring uh, problems or, or discord. They were to bring redemption. They were to bring promise. They were to bring forgiveness and revelation. So that you and your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands I give you so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and, honey, milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Verse 4 should sound very familiar. Remember what Jesus Christ said when he was asked by the religious leader, what is the first and greatest command? Well, what is the greatest command? He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments I give to you today are to be on your, your hearts. You see, God, in this moment, and I want to look at just a few words from Deuteronomy chapter 6. It stood out to me as I was reading it. The first one was this beginning uh, where we're talking about the relationship of God and man and where they're going. And God says to them, fear the Lord your God. I think sometimes the idea of fearing God is really hard for us. How do I fear God? And some people live in, a, in an unhealthy fear of God. A fear that God is looking for the opportunity to disqualify them from the kingdom of God. A fear that God is, is just waiting until they fail so he can throw a lightning bolt. I remember, I heard that. A lightning bolt from heaven at me. So that, 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 that I will, I will uh, be disqualified and discontinued from the earth. Now that's not the nature of a God who loves us. The fear of God. Is an honor or respect, the reverence for God. In the Amplified of this particular translation, it says, Fear and worship the Lord your God with all filled reverence and profound respect. The holy fear of God is the recognition of who God is and how much God knows and what all God can do for me. And because of who he is and what he can do, I want to be where he needs me to be. 
It's the respect, it's the honor, it's the reverence that yes, he is God and I am man. And when I approach him, I need to walk where he needs me to be. That's the fear of the Lord that they're talking about. So then he says, the Lord God, I am the Lord your God. I am one. What a peculiar way for God to introduce himself. I don't know if in your names of God book, if you're talking about the God who is one. What an interesting way for God. Jesus started with this. He didn't start with the love of the Lord your God with all your heart, but he started with the reality that God said, I am the Lord who is, who is one. Now what is God communicating about his nature? What is God saying to the people when he says that I am the Lord who is one? Now if we did an exercise this morning, and I asked us to count the five. Barrett, can you count the five for me? It's good that you have your head down, Levi, because I can see Barrett. Wait, what do we start with? One. one. So one is primary. One is cardinal. One is the beginning, right? That's one aspect of the number one. That idea of one also wasn't just that God is, is primary or he's cardinal, but that God is whole and he is complete. Something that is one, right? A man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two shall become one. That's the same application of this word. We, he is whole and, and complete. So God is saying to the, to the Israelites as they're preparing for the promise, I've given you the commandments. I am private. I am whole and I am complete. Now it's peculiar to us a little bit because we don't have a lot of the Eastern religions where we're picking pieces of gods. But that's what Israel was doing. Remember they would go into these places and they weren't allowed to marry the Canaanites guys in Bible study because they had four gods. They would Baal and, and Asher poles and all these things. They would pick and choose parts of gods. And they would worship different parts of different gods. And he said, no, I need to be primary. I need to be the beginning. I need to be one. I am whole. There isn't a part of me that you can pull away. I am complete. And they're giving you the covenant. I'm giving you the words, the commands that I have. They're yours for today. So he says... I'm the Lord who is one. So love the Lord who is one, your God, with what? All your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. What is, what is the, the meaning of, of heart? Now, we have Valentine's Day coming up. I'll mention that. As I'm preaching through my purpose, guess what comes on February 11th? It's a sermon on impact. I've already placed an order for 250 roses. I'm telling you this now so you can begin to seek the Lord and ask whose life he wants you to impact this year. <coughs> who, can, who can you take a rose to and tell them that the, the, the God of all, Lord who is one, loves them? So just be praying about that. That's just a, a, a precursor of what's to come. Valentine's Day, it's all about our hearts, right? Our hearts everywhere. We, we associate Valentine with just the emotion of love. Biblically, heart is the inner man. It's the will. It's the mind. It's kind of what's inside of a person. Then he says, love him with all your soul. That's your, your living being, your desires, your passion. So, so then he goes to love him with, with all your strength is the way it's interpreted. And I looked at that word. It was interesting. Because it's not the word like, oh, I got muscles. It's not the word like, well, there's power like that, that makes things go. Do you know what the word most often is translated? <coughs> very. Like very. Like when Jesus or when God created, and he looked at creation and in all the days he said it was good, and then that one day he said it's very good. You know, we look at this as is strength and it becomes works. It becomes all we put our hands to. It's not just that simple. It's all the, the excess. It's almost like the, 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 the way God was explaining, we're starting on the inside and we're moving outward with all that we are. With your heart, that's what's inside of you. With your being, that's who you are. With, with everything, with the very in your life. Love with what is beyond you. I read a commentary on this. It said, so if the word 
usually means very, what would it mean to love the Lord with all of our veriness? Interestingly, Greek translations of this word is power. The Aramaic translation as well. Both of these may actually be pointing the same direction. For the strength of a person is not simply who he is, but what he has at his disposal. Think with me. If Moses was called to love Yahweh, he starts with our heart and moves out to our being. Could not our veriness be one step bigger and include all of our resources? This means to love God is not only with our physical muscle, but with everything we have available for honoring God. He said, I am one. And he's showing us to love him with all the wholeness of who we are. It's not just an emotional response. It's not just a physical response. It's not just a, a work to be accomplished. It's with everything that we are. We are to love God. And again, it, it causes us to wonder, what does that mean? We want steps, right? Don't give us some steps, but we don't like them. Because he says, to start by loving me, you will obey my commands. We're going to talk next week. I promise you, I'll give you a precursor. If you want to read 1 John chapter 4, you're going to see what loving people is about. And God right out says that to love God is to love people. If you love me, you will love my people. You want to talk about hard sometimes. Pastors aren't allowed to say that law. Loving people is a reflection of my love for God. First John chapter 4 says something else as well. This is how we love. This is how that we know we live in him and he in us. He's given us of his spirit and we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. See, it's primary. It's one. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love why? We love because he loved us first. Too often the conversation about how we love God starts with what we do, starts with what we're saying, starts with how we're acting or what we're doing. But the reality is the conversation about how you love God must start with the God who is love. That God loved you first. And in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, he says that while we were still sinners, God demonstrated his love for us. Then he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. We know God's love. We love God in response to the love that he's shown us. Does that make sense? Too often we're defining love apart from the love of God. We cannot define our love for God apart from his love for us. I can only love him because his love was demonstrated to me. And when I start to recognize the fullness of his love, when I start to recognize the greatness of his love, when I start to recognize the extravagance of his love, how great, 1 John chapter 3, is the love that the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is who we are. Maybe my quest for identifying my love for the Father needs to start with my remembrance of his love that's been revealed to me. I was thinking back to that sonnet. How, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Maybe, just maybe, our reflection today should not be how do I love thee, but how do thee love me? Oh my Father, how do you love me? Let me count the ways. 
You begin to look at the way in which God loves you. You begin to think about the ways in which his extravagant love has been poured out on you. You look at the things that he's done, the people that he's brought, the lives that he's changed, the forgiveness that you're living in, the reality of Jesus Christ, and suddenly your heart begins to position yourself toward him, and you say, tell me whatever you want. Because I want to remain. I want to abide. You are the vine. I'm the branches. I need to be a part of you. I don't want to be apart from you. I praise you with my lips. My heart, my inner being will be inclined to you. My life, my sustenance, who I am, they will declare that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Everything at my disposal, my home, my family, my goods, whatever it is, my gifts, they're in your hands, Father. That's how we love God. You guys can come forward. As they're coming, and as we proceed this morning, I, I just want to encourage you to reflect. I'm talking about obeying these commands. I can talk about trusting in Him. I can talk to you about the reality of His covenant, but that covenant was revealed because of the love of God. So this one, for just a few moments, I don't care if you want to use a cell phone, I don't care if you want to use a piece of paper, I don't care if you're just one of those super smart people, you can keep it all in your mind. Take a moment and reflect on how has God loved you? How has God's love been revealed to me? How have I seen his love this week, this year, in the last five years? What have I seen the love of God revealed completely? Those moments that, man, when they happened, you thought you'd never forget, and you got about three feet away and you couldn't remember what just happened? You know what I'm talking about? Maybe we need to focus on how does he love me? Take some time and reflect. And I believe that the expression, the reflection of the love of God. You see, he talks about we're like a mirror, we're in the image of Christ, that we begin to reflect back to him. And we begin to reflect to others the love that God has demonstrated to us. That's the kingdom living he's called us to. Father, this morning, in this place, I pray, Lord, that we would be about your mission. The mission that I believe as a pastor to give in the Christ Community Church, that we are a people who love God wholeheartedly. That God, in the next few moments, you can remind, you can reveal. Holy Spirit, we submit ourselves to you to, to bring back those moments, to bring back the revelations, to remind, to stir, to guide, and to direct where our hearts need to be. Those places, Lord, that you demonstrate love. And God, this morning, if there's anyone who needs to know God in this place, if there's anyone who says, Pastor, I just, I need love. Maybe today is the day. Today is one of those moments. If there's someone who hasn't recognized the, the reality that God, that, that while I was still a sinner, while I was still doing things that kept me separated from his love, he sent Jesus Christ as the price to pay. He sent Jesus Christ as the atoning sacrifice for the forgiveness of my sin. Because the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is eternal separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life that comes through Jesus Christ. That God so loved the world, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die. So we would not be condemned. God, I pray that this morning, we can either remember or we can experience the love that you have for us. And if there's anything, Lord, that's kept us separated from your love, 
If there's anything in our life, Lord, that's trying to redefine the love that you've given us, I pray that you would be the author and finisher of it all. And Lord, as we reflect, transform our hearts. Our voices. Our being. Our weariness. Into your will.